Welcome, everybody. It looks like people are coming in from our last session. So thank you for joining us. Uh, with me here is Christina Gerakides uh, from Singularity U Australia. She's going to be doing a hybrid kind of talk workshop. So lots of engagement to come, but really to help you build an action plan um, during times of uncertainty. So she's the co-CEO of Singularity U Australia, one of our amazing partners. She's a catalyst for change and has the talent for alchemizing the impossible into the possible. She knows human potential is unlimited. Christina is passionate about experiential learning and is a sought after corporate and university program designer and facilitator. She lectures regularly in business, innovation, and entrepreneurship, where she encourages moonshot thinking, which we're going to talk about today. So Christina, thanks for joining us today. It's all yours. Thanks, Adam. And thank you to a remarkable team for doing an amazing job over the last few days. Uh, I know how much work would have gone into everything that you've prepped. So thank you from all the country partners. Today, we're going to talk about um, six steps to moonshot thinking. So there actually has not been a better time to put your head into moonshot thinking space. And, a, and for those of you that are unsure, a moonshot is committing to solving a specific problem before you actually know how to make it happen. Uh, and I think we're all living in a time right now where this has been, this is so uh so predominant in our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, I go to bed one night thinking I've got the next day all sorted and then I wake up to different news, something else happening around the world um, and I need to shift my thinking a little bit. So committing to solving a specific problem before you know how to make it happen. We're going to be doing some um, question answer work throughout um, the next 40 minutes or so. And what I'd ask you to do is have some kind of writing implement ready. Uh, there's some scientific evidence to say that if you actually write uh, it kind of embeds itself into into your body, your psyche, your your connecting dots um, better than if you just type it. If typing is what you really want to do, making some notes onto your computer, go right ahead. But if you can have something ready um, for that process to happen, that would be amazing. Number one step to dreaming ten times is to set the expectation. So when we're moonshot thinking, we really know really need to know how to set the expectation. And what I want to do is set the expectation for what your moonshot might be um, in a couple of ways. First of all, you've had remarkable information over the last, you know, almost three days from um, my colleagues who are situated globally. So a lot of information that has come at you. Your business, your personal alignment to one or more of the global grand challenges will really help you nail a moonshot during this session. So if that's education, if it's wellness, whatever area it is, if you can think in terms of an alignment with your personal beliefs, your business beliefs, that would be fantastic. The other thing we really encourage you to do is um, potentially put some of those responses in the chat uh, and um, we'll have people monitoring those and then we'll do a little bit of Q&A at the end. So set the expectation. I want to tell you a bit of a story. This is my grandfather and my grandmother, Giriakos Yarakitis. I can say that because I was the girl at the end of my big frat Greek wedding where people said, or she said, do I have to go to Greek school? And the answer to me was yes. And I went to Greek school two hours, three afternoons a week after I'd had a full day of, um, of normal school. So Giriakos Yarakitis, when he was 15 years old, was set the expectation and it was pretty moonshot because we're going back, you know, 70, 70 years. He was set the expectation that he would travel from a tiny Greek island. This is Kithira. It's about, it feels like it's three miles by five miles of solid rock. Um, but the tiny Greek island of Kithira, he was set the expectation to sail, which would take him about three months, from Kithira to Australia. And he was set the task of making money to bring his six siblings from Kithira to Australia because the, the idea was that they would have a better life, there was more opportunity for work, um, but there was the expectation that was set for him. I think about sending my 15-year-old on a three-month overseas trip where he doesn't know the language and he is expected to find a job, work enough money to bring siblings out, and I go, there is no way I believe that that could happen. So huge expectation for a 15-year-old. My grandfather was very entrepreneurial and he in fact brought five of his siblings to Australia. The sixth sibling, the youngest one, refused to go um, and ended up passing away a few years ago on the, on the island of Kithira. He didn't want to leave. 
My grandfather opened several shops, milk bars, as was the tradition for, um, for Greeks to do in that time. And I think it was by accident, well, I'm pretty sure it was by accident, but my grandfather actually invented choc tops. They called them chocolate bombs. So if you can see in, the, in one of those photos, um, that's my father with the, with the little moustache and holding the choc bombs. But what happened was my Uncle Ben would come home from university, put some vanilla ice cream into a cone, dunk the cone into this amazing chocolate mix that my grandfather made um, to cover Easter eggs with, um, and drip chocolate all over the floor. So I'm not sure whether he, my grandfather was scared of my grandmother's reaction to all the chocolate on the floor and didn't want to clean up, uh, but he ended up playing around with a Kofa recipe, coming up with a recipe that would freeze on top of the, um, on top of the ice cream, and that's how chocolate bombs, choc tops were born. They took them to the Royal Easter Show um, in Sydney, Australia, and they sold out in about three hours. So what I'm trying to let you know here is that for a Greek migrant 70 years ago or more, or more, um, he made the impossible possible. Not only did he invent things like the chalk bombs and violet crumble, he's responsible for the recipe for violet crumble, uh, but he also brought his siblings over um, so impossible had actually become possible for him. So moonshot thinking, set the expectation and let's see where it goes. So the next thing is what is your expectation? What's the expectation? What's the end result that you want to achieve? And here's a couple of examples. This is what I want you to now answer. What is your expectation that you can set aligned to the global grand challenges that you may have aligned yourselves with um, during the last few days? But if you can take a couple of minutes, what's the expectation that you would like to set to set a moonshot idea? I'll give you a couple of minutes. We should have some thinking music. I'm just going to have a look at what you might be coming up with. Do you want people to post it in the chat, Christina? Yeah, yeah I think I mentioned that a bit earlier. So if they want to, if they actually want to write it down, and also if they want to um, put it in the chat, that would be great. And if anybody wants to, um, can we open mic, Adam, and have a couple of contributions or are we not doing that? We, we can if you'd like to try it. We haven't done it yet. Okay, well, we're, what are we, third last session, second last session, we could give it a go maybe or see if a hand goes up. If it doesn't work in this first instance, we can, uh, we can not do it for the other questions. I like that. Somebody's just put make vaccines, quick, safe, quick, safe, safe vaccine. Revamp governance, yes, I actually agree with that. I think now is a really good time for us to to change the whole way that we're thinking about things, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in this talk. Floating cities, fantastic. Uh, I was just reading an article that uh, that said, <laughs> and listening to James just before about what, what we believe and what we don't believe, um, but some of the wildlife is coming back to the canals in Venice at the moment. Oh, okay, so what's your expectation? I'm going to move on to the next to the next section. So have an idea of what your expectation is, what it is that you would like to do. My grandfather was expected to leave this tiny Greek island at a very young age, um, come over to Australia, make enough money to bring brothers and sisters back. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is shift our perspective. Here's a couple of stories around why shifting perspective is really good. Our best work actually comes when we marry the values of humanity. We intersect those with the value of technology. So the other thing I can see happening right now is that we are taking the best of both worlds. So people are being made to work from home. So those people who may not have been overly familiar with um, digital technology and what was going on uh, in the digital world have been forced almost into finding out what the attributes, what the positive effects are of a staying connected and I know one of the one of the speakers this morning actually said we shouldn't call it social distancing we should potentially just call it physical distancing because we don't want to distance ourselves physically or socially from anyone it's the physical distance that is of benefit to us right now so the values of humanity are being married with the value of technology so if it wasn't for the technology if it wasn't for the internet if it wasn't for um, for platforms such as this and other platforms that people are using 
we wouldn't have that connectedness at the moment. So our best work comes when we intersect the values of humanity with the value of technology. Please remember that. So here's where that's happened. Um, and this is actually, there's some research being done um, on this in my hometown, but there's the research in the States is a little bit more advanced. What has happened is they've taken quadriplegics, paraplegics and immersed them in augmented reality, virtual reality. So using different forms of technology and the immersion is into walking, moving, doing activities that potentially they were, they were partaking in before. There was a gentleman in my hometown who had an accident on a bike, got knocked over by a car, um, became a quadriplegic and we have an amazing young scientist, Dr. Um, Jordan Nguyen, who spoke at our summit last October, um, who is doing some work in this field. Immersion in, in augmented reality and virtual reality and then at a three-month mark has used more technology. So what we're doing here is converging different technologies and this is why impossible to possible moonshotting has never been more able to have an end result because we now know that when we converge different technologies, we can get amazing results. So augmented reality, virtual reality, what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is an exoskeleton suit which helps quadriplegics, paraplegics walk. Um, what they noticed after three months immersion in the in AR and VR is that limbs were, were moving um, with the exoskeleton suit. So they were noticing movement and, and nerve reactions in the limbs. What they didn't actually expect was that after seven months, they were noticing movement in limbs on their own without, um, without the assistance of any exoskeleton suit. So that doesn't mean that we're going to solve people that have never, you know, that have had accidents and may never be able to walk again. It doesn't mean that we're going to solve those problems, but it would give me so much hope. So what we're seeing is sensors, augmented reality, virtual reality, many different forms of technology converging to make impossible possible. Another example, this guy, Neil Harbison, is a remarkable human. He's classified as the world's first cyborg and I had, I had the pleasure of sitting next to him um, for dinner one night when we were both speaking at, at, um, at an innovation conference. Neil is colorblind. He is totally colorblind, has been from birth. He wanted to sense color. So what he actually does now is he hears color. Because the sense he has equated to, um, to a sound uh, and therefore the vibrations he's equated to a sound. So what he says is he can hear color. And I said to him, but there's so many operations in that that you can have where you can fix color blindness or you can improve color blindness. And his words to me were, why would I want to do that? He said, I have perfect night vision. I'll never need glasses. He said, I'm quite happy living the way I'm living. I just want to be able to sense different things. So he had a doctor insert um, a chip into, into his skull, the antenna, and it vibrates at different frequencies for different colours. So he says that he dresses according to different rock and roll tunes uh, because he can hear the, the notes. Incredible human. What he's going to do next, um, and he suffers about two years' worth of nausea, um, or suffered two years' worth of nausea when he put the antenna in. I had nausea for about, I don't know, six weeks when I was pregnant. It was the pits. I don't know how he does it for, for two years. Uh, but what he did was, and what he wants to do next is experiment with time. So he wants to get a, a chip inserted here in his skull that takes 24 hours um, to navigate his skull so that he can tell what time it is just from the frequency, the, the sense, the vibration of where, um, of where it's coming from. And then he wants to play around with time. So this guy with a team who are supporting what his tech efforts are has put into practice some of the things um, that he has dreamt about. So again, impossible to possible, remarkable human, world's first cyborg, look him up, have a listen to some of his TED Talks. He's, he's quite remarkable. Shift perspective. This was the biggest lesson for me. So I'm a vegetarian. This is usually the colour palette that I eat from. Uh, and when I went to Singularity U and, and took part in an executive program, which was totally life-changing for me, this was served up one night. It's cellular agriculture. It was created from cells in a lab. Um, and it was a steak. Clearly it was a steak. You can see that. What, what, I didn't eat it. I didn't try it. Um, it was quite expensive at the time. Um, my colleagues at SU had paid quite a lot of money for us to experience what this cellular agriculture tasted like. Uh, and when I came home and I was telling my meat-eating family about the experience, they said, my daughter said to me, did you eat it? And I said, of course not, I didn't eat it. I'm a vegetarian. Why on earth would I eat a steak? 
And she said to me, but you're a vegetarian because of, you know, um, effects on the planet and you don't want animals to be harmed. Why didn't you try that? Because clearly neither of those things have happened in this instance. And what that brought home to me was that for somebody in the innovation game, which I had been at that stage for several years, I still had not shifted my perspective enough to understand that I could have eaten that steak, tried it, had the experience, but because of an inner belief, that didn't happen. Another example I want to give you of that um, is, is Elon Musk when he talks about first principles. There's a couple of really cool um, clips that you can access on YouTube about him talking about first principles. And he talks, he says, people have said that the, um, that the battery will never be cheaper. The battery pack will never be cheaper. And he said, if I take that back to first principles, he said, what we did was we went right down, we drilled right down, asked why five times, first principles is a whole other workshop. Um, but what they found was that they discovered which components have, went into creating this battery pack. And what they were able to do was replace a couple of the components with something else that was cheaper and also rejig the how everything was put together. So never ever think that things cannot be shifted because we take things down to first principles or we use our collective consciousness to figure out a different way of doing things. So I'm going to pause again for a minute and I want to ask you to commit to shifting your perspective. What is it that you can, and you might think you're as open-minded as I used to think I was uh, until I had the meat experience, but how will you commit to shifting your perspective in order to potentially have a moonshot that you can then start actioning. I'll give you a couple of minutes. I'm going to have a look at what's coming in on the chat. Um, so the question about colour blindness, I can't answer that definitively because I haven't had that conversation with him, but he does, he does, um, he senses what the colour is and it's because of the implant that he had. So how will you commit two actions that you can write down that you will commit to shifting perspective? Please feel free to write a couple of them in the, um, in the chat. Thank you. By having a smarter and more flexible attitude, learn from the past and then let go of it. Absolutely. And all your assumptions are, assumptions are such a big conversation. Yes. Zara, I like that. Shift away from needing to eat something that looks like a steak. Fantastic. Great responses coming through. So please start putting those into practice the minute that you um that you enter back into into a conversation with somebody whether it's at work or whether it's over the dinner table so some of the best conversations will happen over the dinner table which brings me to another point we've been doing some work with um with an organization we've had to shift everything uh, online at just as this summit is but we're encouraging people to still have meals together you know have a lunchtime gathering together sit down have conversations um, and share experiences Number three, never, ever forget the value of humanity. Never, ever forget the value of humanity in this. And I know um, there's a lot of fear and a lot of panic and, and James just told you about some of the headlines that were happening around the world um, that, that can instigate fear. Uh, and we do need to remember a lot of the positive things that, that people have been letting you know about over the last, um, the last little while. Particularly, I mean, I think one of the hero stories at the moment is the 3D valves that are being printed in Italy and, and saving lives everywhere. The generosity that's coming from, from um, people in China who no longer need masks, etc., and they're being shipped to places like Italy and Iran um, with messages of hope. So the value of humanity. And I'd like you to consider this word in everything that happens, every new experience that we have over the next little while. Humanivate which is where we consider humanity first in the process of innovation because humans are centre of everything. And what we will do is we will take the best of the technology that we're experiencing and the best of humanity and that is where we're going to come up with the moonshots that are going to help us progress, get out of this situation. It's not like we haven't been in crisis before um, and take the opportunities and see the silver linings that are coming at us. So please humanivate. 
Um, at Singularity U, we talk about first order and second order consequences. So if I do this, what might be the result in a little bit of time? And there'll be more on, on that in a minute. So what I would like you to write down now is how will your moonshot help humanity? How will your moonshot help humanity? If you've aligned what your moonshot potentially might be to one of the global grand challenges, how will it help in that field? How will your moonshot help humanity? What's your end goal? When we start with the end in mind, what's the goal that you want to achieve? I'm going to go back to the chat. So I've got a comment here that says, I love humanity, but I think we're naturally selfish. Um, but thanks to incentives and some excellent human beings, we end up okay. Um, I can tell you, so Australia, I know some of my colleagues have shared this with you, but we did bushfires, then we did floods, and now we've got um, now we've got COVID-19. And I can tell you that there were times I was actually in tears watching what people were doing to help each other, to help sentient beings all over the place, the donations that generously went out, um, things that are coming online now and I think what we do is there are more good people in the world than bad I can show you an exercise um, why that works I've done it countless numbers of times I'm going to ask you to take my word for it at this point in time there are more good people in the world than bad sometimes the bad people have louder voices so we're seeing a lot of you know people fighting over toilet paper um, at the moment but we're not actually seeing the people that are helping each other that are dropping in on neighbours We've only just started seeing how Italy is helping each other, playing badminton across balconies, singing arias through cities. Spain have, um, have I just got a, um, a, a clip from a friend of mine who is in lockdown in Spain uh, and the police cars are actually dancing in the streets and um, waving at kids and taking part um, in, in songs with children as well from balconies. So there are many more good people in the world than bad. Let's not give those bad people a louder voice. Yeah, industrial pattern, yes, our land-based industrial pattern. So what we need to be doing is thinking globally and acting locally. I think it's a really nice um, saying that's come out of this. So how's your moonshot going to help humanity? Point number four, consider the consequences. So I lent into this um, just previously, but consider the consequences. At SU, we're very big on first order, second order consequences. What does that look like down the track? Um, and I'm going to tell you a story that best illustrates that, and it's anecdotal. Uh, there's no science behind it. And again, coming from to you from a tiny Greek island, not Githera, I'm not actually going to name this island because it is anecdotal. Um, this, they haven't done the science behind it. What happened on this island was that there was a great, uh, great pest inundation. And the best way that they could deal with this, we're looking back into the into the early 80s uh, is when this happened, late 70s, early 80s, they sprayed. So they sprayed pesticides and guess what? No more pest problem, which was fantastic. So pest problem went away. Um, what happened was the birds either got killed from the poisonous uh, pests that they were eating or they went away as well because there was no food left on the island. And what happened was that um, there was no pooping of seeds around the island. So things got a little bit scarce. So birds had, um, birds had disappeared. Um, seeds weren't being propagated at the, at the same rate. But more tragically, so on this island, they don't drink well water, but they use well water for washing clothes, washing food, watering gardens, washing plates. Um, and at a certain period of time had passed, and the rates of hormonal cancers went up, breast cancers and um, um, prostate cancers. And the thought is that it was about the right timing because the rainwater had washed some of the pesticide residues into the wells, this had an ongoing consequence. Another ongoing consequence has been with, um, with desalination. So we put these desalination plants everywhere uh, and just very rough um, very rough uh, idea of what happens is you take water out and it has 3% salt. What happens when you put the excess back in, it has 5% salt and a few other um, higher levels of chemicals and metals. What's happened is it's starting to have an effect on the marine life. So we go, fantastic, we've got a solution to we need more water, but what we haven't done is considered the first order 
and second order consequences of what we think has been a fix. So what I want you to think about right now and just jot down quickly if you can, what could be a first order consequence of the moonshot that you're thinking, the considerations that you're having, the actions you might want to take, what could be a first order consequence um, that we really need to think through before we make execution plans to bring things into reality. So I'm going back to the chat. Great conversations. David, we need a Noah's Ark. Thank you. What might be first order or second order consequences even of the actions that you may want to take? And the other thing we really need to do um, when we're moonshotting is we actually need to be the change. So I know it's, a, again, it's a common um, phrase people are using, be the change that you want to see, but we really need to be the change. We need to walk the talk. And if you think for one minute that an individual cannot make a difference, I want you to have a look at these two remarkable people. They may polarise um, They may polarize feelings for some people, but they have had a huge impact. Jacinda Ardern is showing amazing leadership in the way she's reacting to COVID-19 and the way she's reacted to health issues prior to COVID-19 uh, within the tiny island of New Zealand. So making a remarkable difference, being really strong, and Greta Thunberg has, has mobilised thousands of students and thousands of adults around the world and has talked about climate and brought climate to the forefront. So what is climate change, whether you agree, whether you're a climate sceptic or not, I'm not going to go into that in this moonshot discussion here. But if you think for one minute that as an individual you cannot have a difference or make a difference, Yes, you can. And it doesn't have to be a difference on a monumental scale like these women are having at the moment. It just needs to have, be a small something that has a ripple effect on the people around you. So I remember um, I used to do quite a fair bit of, um, of uh, facilitating. We ran a, a music festival as part of the music business school um, course that I was involved with. And I remember walking, or I walk a lot. I remember being on a walk one day and hearing my name called and I turned around and a student a next student said to me, you probably don't remember me, but I just want you to know that what you and the others did for us during that period of time has left its mark on me. And what I'm now doing is trying to help other people with that. So even when you don't know that you're making a difference, you will be making a difference to somebody that you have connected with. So make a difference, be the change. Ask yourself, what do you stand for? Especially right now in the current climate, with all the information that you've had around COVID in the last two and a half, three days and beyond. What is it that you want to stand for in this change? We actually have the ability now to rewrite a lot of things that we have maybe have not got quite right. What do you stand for? And more importantly, what do we stand for collectively as a global citizenship? What do we stand for? How do we want to make the world a better place? We've got an opportunity to create amazing change right now. How do we want that to take place? The only way it's going to happen is if we band together um, and speak to, together and connect with each other and realise maybe some of the processes and things that we had in the past weren't quite what they should be. We're walking a tightrope. There's no, no accident. It's no accident that things like universal basic income, cryptocurrency, connectedness, um, wellness, education, we're being tested in every avenue of our lives. And if ever the words around innovation were be fluid and be agile, it's so true right now. So we need to be as fluid and as agile as we possibly can and we need to shift perspective on what we're thinking and we need to be able to dream, dream big because we've never been in this situation before. And if we can't think big and dream big now, that's the permission that we need to give ourselves. We're walking a tightrope. We can either tilt into fear and panic or we can tilt into love and positivity. And my money's on love and positivity because I do know there are more good people in the world than bad. And you've had a whole band of people get together over the last few days to put together this summit for you. And we've had amazing engagement from 20,000 plus people. 
There are more good people in the world than bad. Let's be the voices that actually tilt the planet for good. There are lots of things happening out there right now. We can look at, um, if you haven't yet listened to any of my colleague Pia Mancini's work, please go and have a look at her talks around governance. Alex Gladstein was on yesterday. Have a look at how he sees social governance. We are banding together and we have the opportunity to band together like we never have had before. So I want, to I want you to take a couple of minutes now to consider how you're going to be the change that you want to see in the world. What little effects or what big effects do you want to have? Do you want to have an effect at government level, global level? Do you want to have an effect um, in your home? Whatever it is, take a couple of minutes now to write down a couple of actions that will indicate how you will be the change that you want to see in the world right now. I'm going to go back to the chat. Um, yes, so David, I totally agree with you. We need plans um, and that's where a lot of the moonshot um, ideology comes from. So I'm going to tell you in a minute that it, it, I'll tell you right now, an idea without execution is hallucination. Uh, there's a couple of people that have said that before me. I wish I'd made it up. Um, but an idea without execution is hallucination. So we need to have the idea though. We need to have that dreaming. We need to do the moonshotting and then we need to pace it and go, how do we make this happen? And part of that is shifting perspective. Part of that is how will you be the change that you want to see? For now, by working hard, I will be the change. Thank you. Plans that are real, fantastic. Yes. I love that. Change the sick care system into a health care system. Yep, ideas without execution is hallucination. It's a great saying, spread it far and wide. I think I first heard it from Simon Sinek. I'm very uh, privileged to have done some work with his um, Start With Why team, uh, but I think he actually got it from someone else. Yes, every big change starts with small change. The first one is to change mindset. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is how we really are better together. So even the conversations that are happening on the chat, we're better together. Please collaborate. We've got um, Be Innovative who are running some projects. We've got SU communities all around the world. We've got chapters. Start having conversations. We are much better together. We are much better when we look after each other. So if we see that, that argument happening in the supermarket, what is it that we can do to intervene? I know in Australia, I'm sure it's happening elsewhere around the world, we now have an hour of shopping um, for the elderly and the disabled because... Who can get to the supermarket at 6 o'clock in the morning to buy toilet paper um, or pasta or flour or rice? So stop hoarding everyone. And you've heard the message a lot. a lot. Um, but we are better together when we look after each other. And there's a whole lot of scientific evidence and, and um, my colleague Divya actually talks about it a lot in some of her talks, which you can also access um, on YouTube or through the SU portal. Um, talks a lot about how we release particular hormones and how we feel better when we actually give, not just when we're, when we're receiving. We actually feel better, release more hormones around human kindness and when we're giving rather than when we're simply receiving. So we are better together. And this word gets thrown around a lot, exponential. Um, and we are seeing exponential rises in cases of, of COVID-19, but we're also seeing exponential rises in human kindness. If you just have a look at some of the examples that are happening around you, and it would be lovely if you could put a couple of tiny, small examples about where you've experienced human kindness in the last week, or even it might have been in the last year, you know, it doesn't necessarily, everything's not COVID-19 related. Exponential is an amazing word and it, it is very much aligned with our mission um, at SU. I like this one, exponential. I just wish it was as easy to say, but the one is definitely in there. And if we now serve as one community, whether that's global or local, if we're serving as one community, we are actually showing how we will be better together at solving a lot of the issues that we now face. And I want to want to make this really obvious. I believe that the only way we're going to live with the exponential rate of increase around technology and um, issues like COVID nineteen is to use the exponential rise also in wellness industry, meditation, um, mindfulness, living in the moment, breath, 
dreaming. So there, it's by no accident that we've got exponential tech going like this and exponential change happening very quickly, but we also have a rise in exponential wellness and what that means to meditate, yoga, be mindful. And I think that these practices are rising just as quickly as the tech is rising in our mindset so that we can actually step by step by step by breath through the changes that we're now seeing and that we're now faced with. And I hope I've explained that properly. So as the exponential tech is increasing and changes to our lives are increasing, so is the knowledge and awareness that we should be practicing yoga, meditation, breath, etc. And if we're doing some practice of wellness while the exponential change is happening and if we're walking at a similar pace and we're stopping and considering, then we have a much better opportunity of avoiding the anxiety and the panic that a lot of people um, are experiencing. And better together, I'm going to circle back and tell you a story, another story about my grandfather. So my grandparents had, that's my grandmother, um, Chrysula Yerakipi, an amazing strong woman who was um, very much um, a feminist in the true sense of the word and very much supported by her husband and her five sons. Uh, but it was my uncle's birthday, one of my uncle's birthdays, and my grandfather lined them all up and he gave them a twig each and he said to them, snap the twig. And, you know, being the Greek Adonises that they were, snapped the twig quite easily uh, and, you know, went, what's next, Dad? Um, and then what he did was he had five pre-prepared, um, five twigs bound together, five lots of them, and he handed each son, each five sons got five twigs that were bound together. He said, now break it. And as you can imagine, it was much more difficult. I think it's a great exercise. I've actually done it with my children um, and I've done it with some um, university students as well. Try it. It's amazing. Uh, and that it was much more difficult to break. And that was his lesson. If as brothers they bonded together and they acted together and they supported each other, how much stronger were they as a unit? And that's what I want to say to you, um, all the people that are listening, and share with your families and your colleagues and everything if we stay together, if we band together, if we look after each other, if we marry the values of humanity with the value of technology, then what we're going to see is we can face the crisis and potentially we will unite better than we ever have united before. We always potentially thought that, you know, this, this big threat was going to come from, you know, aliens in outer space and we were all prepared, if you watch all the movies, to band together um, and to do remarkable things as a community in that instance. Let's do that now. And what we're seeing is with open sourcing, with information, with, you know, 3D printing of, of valves, with sending boxes of care to places that are in dire need of them right now, we are seeing this community global effort. Be a part of it. Be that change. Know that we are better together. I want to leave you with be well and thank you. Happy to connect with, um, with anybody as you might need to connect with. I'm going to come back with Adam for potentially a couple of questions if anybody has them because I think we still have a little bit of time. Uh, but please feel free to connect. The slide deck will be available. Um, please be better together. Let's face this thing together. You've got a plethora of information that you can now put to, to amazing use um, that we've been exposed to over the last few days. So let's do this. Adam. Thank you, Christina, for that unifying message, which is what we all need to hear as much as we need to practice safe uh, physical distancing. We are in this all together for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, you had a you had probably the most lively chat that we've seen so far. So congratulations on absolutely nailing that. Thanks. I I'd love so to get a copy of them as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. we can, we can definitely do that. Yeah. I'll see if some questions roll in here. I'm sure lots of people are asking themselves many questions coming out of it. Uh, the only one that's in here that you haven't answered is uh, how do you define values, which I think is probably something you were maybe talking about earlier. Yeah. So values, um, values are a, a whole conversation, aren't they? Because our values are created by our perceptions, by our experiences. Um, and there is some scientific work to say that we innately know what feels good and what doesn't feel good. Um, so I think values come from a very personal space to begin with, uh, and there's something that we need to fully align with and fully feel comfortable with. And we could have had exactly the same 
experiences, but we will have different perspectives on what those experiences are. Um, values are very much tied in the conversations that we're having around ethics, for example. Um, so values aren't that easy to define, but they're really easy to talk about. And we're, it's really easy to go, what do we see as common values in our homes? What do we see as common values with our colleagues? Um, but the other, the other test around values is we work with a few organisations and, and I've said to them, I work with a lot of organisations, but I've said to them, okay, so you've got this really great list of values. A, can you cite them without reading them? And, and if they can, then I know that, that we're working with a, an authentic organisation who really treasures what their values are. But then we say to them, most of these are nouns. How do you transfer a value into a verb? What does it look like when you're actually living it every day? And a really good exercise for that that I'd like to share with you to take back to some of your organisations is if you assign a value that you might have, just let's just say um, it's um, the value is honesty. How do you assign that value? You might assign that to your sales team, for example. Okay, you might assign honesty to your sales team and you ask them, what is the action that you're going to take this week? So we, we work each value for a whole week. What is the action that you're going to take around this value this week to show that it's a verb and not just a fluffy word? Um, and that actually instigates quite deep thinking, quite deep conversation around what that value is. But the action could be as simple as, and this one organisation came up with this, they had honesty, and they said, okay, we are going to make a, a concerted effort that when we are talking to someone this week, we are going to have the whole conversation looking at somebody. So eye to eye contact, that's how we're going to display honesty. So if my eyes avert from you, potentially I'm not living up to what that honesty is. But when I am looking at you, you're going to be reminded that one of the chief values for this organisation is honesty. Take the value, turn it into a verb. It becomes part of the habit and it becomes part of the reality. I, lo I love that. And I, I've had a similar experience with values where it, it almost feels... Um, Easy is the wrong word, but simpler just to say, oh, well, my values are uh, openness or transparency or honesty or whatever. But it's so much more useful when you come up with the, uh, the like, how, how will you know if you're living this? Like, what are the actions that you can take to really make sure that uh, you're in alignment with those values? Because to your point, honesty is different for everybody. That's right, yeah. And especially yeah. for a team and an organization, you got to be clear on what that means. And here's a, here's a question. If you tell a white lie, is it a lie or is it shading hurt from someone and does it fit honesty? Uh, and I had an experience where I, I learned about this and I went, right, tomorrow everything I say is going to be 100% honest, no white lies, I'm not saving anyone's feelings. I found that at certain times I didn't even talk because I had made the deal with myself that I wouldn't say anything that wasn't 100% honest and it was at that point that I realised how many times I might have said something that wasn't 100% honest and I don't know how you get something that's 100% honest or 70% honest. For me, it's either honest or it's not um, without compromising somebody's feelings. So it's a really hard value to live 100% by. So true. So true. Uh, Ed asked, I think, a really uh, interesting question. What's a good way to gather the right talent for a moonshot? Um, so people who you, so you need a variety. So we hear diversity of teams. So true. You cannot be a lone ranger on a moonshot. You can have the idea, but you need all the other people to come on board and help you turn it into reality. But not only that, you actually need other people on board to, to keep moonshotting what that moonshot might be. And we often talk in terms of levels. So you come up with a moonshot and then someone goes, yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and. And hopefully at the end of it, you may not even align that completely with what the original moonshot was because it's been this group community effort and all of a sudden it's bigger than what you could possibly believe. Um, and then if you don't have the right team, if you don't go from ideation to execution, it's been a really nice exercise in what is it that we can create together, aren't we wonderful together, um, but it's of no value, you know, um, ideation without execution is hallucination. So you need the the marketer potentially, you need the engineer who can structure the whole thing, you need the pragmatic process person, you need the visionary. Um, and it's no accident that the big organisations, you know, like, um, for example, like Apple, um, and, you know, Steve Jobs was a visionary, but without the Wozniak who went, hang on, let's just process this out, it was never going to happen. Same with Walt Disney. There's not many people that know Walt Disney's brother's name. Let's see if somebody can put it in the chat. Um, but Walt Disney kept having these huge visions 
but it was his brother who actually made those visions. He, you know, he said, hey, well, pull it back here a bit. We really need to make some of these happen. It's okay to keep having the dreams, um, but without without putting them into reality, that's not going to happen. You need UX. So that reminded me of, I was fortunate enough to be at um, Disney Imagineering earlier in January when trouble wasn't an issue. Um, and we went to Disney Imagineering where UX is absolute king. It was the most remarkable um, experience that we had. Everything in that organisation is thought out from beginning to end. So part of that is what is the user experience along the way? So when we're moonshotting and then we create it and we put it into reality, what is the user experience? How are we studying? How the end person at the end of that day is going to feel about whatever it is that you've come up with? So UX, marketing, sales, um, the visionary, the pragmatist, the project manager, whoever you can pull into that team, but they have to believe in it. They have to really want to work with you in order to create the moonshot, to bring the moonshot into reality. For sure. And and I'll add one more thing to that, um, Ed, as well, is that you can't be afraid to share your moonshot. And yeah. I think so often people are like, oh, I've got this great idea, but I can't tell you about it. Share it with people and the right people will come and find you. And then it's up to you to, to, to make sure they're in the right seat to go make it happen. Absolutely. All right. Well, that takes us to the end of our time. Is there any final wisdom you'd like to end us with? If you have an idea, just do it. Um, and please share conversation, share eye contact. We're running a, a complete online program at the moment that was meant to be people in a room. You know, don't go into, into a room like this or into a Zoom or whatever, whatever it is that you're using, whatever platform you're using, and keep your video off. Uh, we really need to have that eye contact, to have that social connection with people still. We are we are lucky, not lucky, that at the time that this is happening, uh, we're not lucky that it's happening, but we are lucky that at the time that this is happening that we can still stay connected to people all over the world um, through, through platforms like this. Stay connected, make time, have meals, um, but better together, and we can get through this together. Yes, we can. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us, Christina. We appreciate you and uh, stay healthy down there in Australia. Thanks, Adam. Stay well and be healthy, everybody, as well. Okay, thanks, crew, for uh, sticking around. It looks like you got lots out of that one. Um, Ed, you are absolutely welcome. For those of you that have been asking, it looks like we may have just uh, had some folks uh, wake up in different parts of the world, or at least they're joining us for the first time. Yes, all this is recorded uh, while it's live right now. This session will be a available immediately as a replay on Crowdcast. And then once we download them, we are also putting them on YouTube. The team will have links here shortly if they maybe, oh, I think they're just about to share them. Um, so yes, we've got two more sessions to go in our virtual summit. So I know many of you have been here for a while and we so, so appreciate you hanging out with us and uh, hope that that means that you've been getting a lot out of it for sure. We've got, there we go, the link to previous YouTube uh, or previous sessions there on YouTube. We've got the Facebook group where more conversations will continue well after this summit. Uh, we've got some shared resources. We'll give you the link to the web page there, um, just so that you've got you've got the most currently published one and not the link to the Google Doc. And then of course we've got six challenges up on Be Innovative. We've been crowdsourcing ideas this whole uh, virtual summit. So please go contribute there if you haven't already. And with that, I'm going to go get Catherine Brown and Chip Norcross ready for our session talking about complexity, which as many of you have, have talked about so far here, uh, sometimes we're, we're holding on to a lot of competing ideas. There's a lot of stuff going on. If you remember that graphic from Eric Rasmussen with all the information flows and connectivity and all, how all these things are uh, interrelated, we're going to get into that here shortly. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be back in about five to 10 minutes.